Let's see, are we cooking? We're cooking. Uh, okay, so we were uh, uh, looking at some of the uh, technology differences between uh, cable and DSL, right? Uh, so tell me, what did, what did we find out? Give me, give me the give me the the highlights. Go ahead. DSL existed over pre-existing telephone lines, not the wire. Okay. So we were able to use an existing infrastructure mm -hmm. for doing it. Okay, as opposed to cable. How do, how do cable modems work? All right, so we had a probably a smaller network of coaxial cables in, in, in different places, but you know certainly telephone was more prevalent than cable. You know they came after, so you were dealing with a you know smaller pre-existing uh, networks. Okay, um, what else? Go ahead. Speed. Speed. Okay, tell me about tell me about the speed. Okay, so in the early days, speed is a little bit relative because they were both relatively slow compared to what we see today. Um, what ended up happening is we started, you know, we ended up bumping into the kind of that wall um, where DSL stopped getting faster and cable were still increasing speed on, on cable. Um, uh, okay, so, um, but you, uh, you mentioned that cable is shared, right? Yeah. So the, the, we have an amount of bandwidth that these guys are, are sharing, um, and uh, you know, so that it's all pulling from the, uh, a pool where DSL is dedicated, provided that there's a, uh, enough bandwidth to split it. But you know, we we run into a similar thing with DSL as you do with the airlines, where they oversell the planes. You know, so they can sell, uh, let's say, a hundred uh, eight megabit per second circuits. Uh, you know, but they only have bandwidth for 75 of them. So they just cross their fingers and hope that more than 75 people aren't trying to maximize their connection at the same time. Um, so, okay, so one's shared, one's dedicated, provided there's enough uh, bandwidth behind the scenes. So at the end of the day, they are, are they're almost both shared. Uh, they're almost both a shared technology because they're they are reliant on maximum number amount of bandwidth, but uh, where cable, um, well, so when would the the sharing nature of cable modems be uh, uh, felt? When would that mean something to us? Okay, where a bunch of people in your neighborhood are all uh, doing something. Now, is this something specific to uh, um, cable modems, cable internet, or is this something specific to cable technology in general? coaxial technology in general. Okay, so when would we see this type of problem in uh, normal cable television? The whole sharing limitation, or the sharing, the sharing issue not really exists when we deal with, with TV. I don't think it exists. Yeah, I don't think it exists in the day, does it? Well, it does. How many of you in here have uh, um, a Cable television is your provider, either Time Warner or Comcast, something like that. Okay, so uh, uh, any situation you can think of when uh, um, you figure bandwidth might be an issue? <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't see an issue ever with TV, with channels specifically. Okay. Like, I mean, I, 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 with I, sharing, it would have to be like, I'm thinking like the Super Bowl, that when everybody's watching television. Let's see, actually, that's easy. Oh. Super Bowl is an easy problem to solve because it's a broadcast uh, sure. thing. So have you ever been on any of you who are cable TV users? Have you ever been on a channel and it pops up and asks you if you're still watching? No. Or have you ever been trying to switch to an HD channel and it says this channel is currently unavailable, try again soon or something like that? I've had, I've had the are you still watching, but I think that's just Comcast. Is that Comcast modem just saying? No, well, they're doing it for a reason. So every high definition show, well every show period takes up one amount of bandwidth. Yeah. High definition shows take up a bigger chunk of bandwidth. There is a maximum amount of bandwidth that can go across those cables. All right, and so let's say you have everybody in a neighborhood all trying to watch uh, uh, the Science Channel in HD. If everybody's watching the Science Channel in HD, there's actually only one stream of Science Channel. 
So everybody can can get that get get that channel no problem, no harm, no foul, just like the Super Bowl. Because you're kind of just, you know, almost like dipping your your uh, your your finger into the water and you can take a take a sip. So, you know, it's, it's just flowing on the channel. Well, if you're watching Science Channel and you're watching National Geographic and, you know, 10 different high definition channels and let's say your bandwidth in your area can only uh, handle eight simultaneous HD streams. So that means everybody in the neighborhood can watch as much as they want of those eight. But if a person wants to watch a ninth one, it'll say, oh, this channel is currently not available or something like that because there wasn't enough available bandwidth on the uh, cable network to deliver another stream. And that's when it might start popping up on people's TV saying, are you still watching this? To see if this is a, you know, the TV is just left on in the background and taking up a high definition stream when nobody's actually watching it. That kind of makes sense? So that, that shared capacity, we don't recognize it as often now because, you know, we, we do have a, um, a relatively large bandwidth on our, on our networks. But um, the bandwidth that we're dealing with when we talk about maximum bandwidth for uh, television programs is actually not the same thing as our internet bandwidth. Uh, there is a difference between the bandwidth across a network medium and then the bandwidth that we're actually providing as a, as a source signal. So a coaxial cable can mac has a maximum bandwidth significantly larger than we are currently pushing with our internet technologies. So the fact that our internet is going over a coaxial cable, the coaxial cable is not our bottleneck. Okay, our bottleneck is the, you know, the actual source internet bandwidth that's happening at Time Warner or something like that when they're connecting into the internet, the actual main place. They're only able to, you know, give you so much bandwidth across your network. They haven't maximized their network yet. But when you start thinking about that we have hundreds of TV stations and they found ways to compress all these stations, that's why we have a set-top box, right? The set-top box serves two purposes. In the early days... The purpose of the set top box was uh, security, to make sure people didn't steal cable. You know, basically, you, you give us fifty dollars a month, we give you a set top box, and now you can decode our channels. But now channels are also compressed, so that box is decompressing the uh, the video as it's coming in to show it on your TV. Because the more they compress video, the more individual channels we can have across the same bandwidth. Right? We're sticking more stuff into the same amount of bandwidth. Um, so that's kind of a, uh, uh, a cable, a cable thing. So we do still have, uh, the shared issue today, but we don't recognize it, uh, that much. It only comes up every now and then, and they usually hide it behind a, oh, it must be a power saving feature or something like that. Right. Um, so, uh, and I mean, Netflix does the same thing, right? You know, if you ever, when you're binging a show and after like six episodes, it says, are you still watching? How many of you have seen that? Too, too many of us, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, they're trying, you know, Netflix is saying, well, you're paying for the service, fine, but we don't want you just streaming bandwidth from us that you aren't actually watching. You know, so if you fall, fall asleep while you're binge watching Breaking Bad, uh, you know, you don't want to wake up and you're, you know, halfway through the next season of streaming while you were asleep. Because you now used up a whole bunch of uh, their bandwidth, a whole bunch of your bandwidth, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, what else about uh, cable versus DSL? So cable is shared, DSL is not. What about the early days of these uh, uh, technologies? What, well, actually, let's, let's go modernly. Which would you rather have today? If both were available in your area, which would you rather have today and why? Well, it depends. It depends on how far we are from the planet. So. Yeah, they're both available. They're, they're both available to you at, the, at, their, at their best speed. Yeah. Cable? Why cable? Okay, so even in the most ideal situation today, cable is faster than DSL. Right? Well, the, the max of both. Yeah, if you max out both, the maximum on cable is substantially faster than the maximum on DSL. Depending on your central office with the... Well, really? So let's say you live right next door to the central office. So you get your absolute maximum speed of DSL. 
the maximum speed of DSL is still slower than the maximum speed of cable. You know, there there are places that are offering uh, um, there are places now that are offering uh, let's say three four hundred megabit per second uh, cable, and you're not going to get anywhere near that with DSL. You know, I think we mentioned uh, last time. I mean, realistically, the fastest DSL you really find is usually like eighteen megabits per second. I think some places will do up to twenty four megabits per second, but I mean, you're Basically, maximum speed of DSL if the moon's aligned is kind of a middle-of-the-road speed for cable modems um, in terms of what the maximum speed of cable modems and are. And depends on what your, your family is using, like user and your, your family. So oh, okay, yeah, now you can start getting into, like, package plans and stuff where it might make more sense if you don't need 400 megabits per second and you're already uh, an AT&T U-verse user customer, maybe it makes sense with a package thing to get U-verse DSL as opposed to uh, paying for Time Warner, for example. Um, now, in my house, we have U-verse for TV, but I use Time Warner for internet. Um, but I, I mean, I use the, the bandwidth. You know, one, uh, and, and so when we look at today's world, um, is 24, so let's just assume the moons are aligned in your in your neighborhood and you can get 24 megabits per second with DSL, so fast DSL. And that's megabits, not megabytes, Dover? Yeah, we haven't seen my paper, I said megabit bytes. So megabit bytes. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Um, <laughs> so uh, um, do you need more than that? Yes, always. Yes. Why do we need? Oh, always, always. So, so faster is always better. Oh, okay. So, so tell me. You're gonna come up with a scenario where having more speed is worse. Is what you're about to do. More speed is worse if you are paying for it, and not using it. Well, in this scenario, I, so get, how how do we use it? How do we use it? So, how are you going to actually utilize 24 megabits per second? I'm gonna run a seed box on my network. And okay, so for for torrents, you're gonna to be part of the the network. No, what? <laughs> no, what? <laughs> Go ahead. You're doing a lot of like streaming, I guess, high quality video on demand. Okay. Um, so what? Uh, now, when you say a lot of streaming, what do you mean? If you're streaming a lot of uh, simultaneous shows on Netflix or something like that, or if you're just streaming Netflix all the time? No, if you're streaming yourself playing video games or something like that, that's what. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> if you stream yourself watching Netflix sure. while playing video games, <laughs> and then you can just keep kind of like folding it back on itself. If you're streaming yourself, streaming yourself, streaming yourself, streaming Netflix, playing video games. <laughs> um, so let's say you're streaming 4K content on uh, Netflix or something like that. So. That's our kind of our biggest footprint of streaming crap today, 4K content. And, and we know that there's this buffering thing that happens, right? So we download some of the show initially, and then once we're, you know, it kind of detects how fast our internet is and, and makes sure that we have enough of the show to keep ahead. So we're downloading while we're still watching, something like that. Okay. Um, what, I think we looked it up last time. What kind of bandwidth do we need for 4K, Dover? Bandwidth. 4K yeah. yep. uh, ooh, seven or is it 15? 15. 15 megabits per second. Okay, so 15. Uh, uh, so net, what Netflix says they want you to have 15 megabits per second for for a quality 4K streaming. All right, so we can do 4K. Uh, 25. 25. Okay. That's not that's not Netflix though. Oh whatever, it, it doesn't matter. This this this, will, the, the, this example this example works just fine. So let's, we'll split the difference. Let's say 20 megabits. 20 megabits per second is the what the internet connection speed we should have in order to stream 4K content. Does that mean anything less than 4K content, it would be impossible to stream 4K? Or I, I'm sorry, does that mean anything less than 20 megabits per second, it would be impossible to stream 4K? Just means you'd have to buffer longer. Um, but more than likely, you know, like Netflix checks your connection and says, okay, well you'd have to buffer for an hour and a half to stream an hour and a half show. <laughs> so <laughs> that's not a good idea. So we're going to bump you down to one of our other their, their lesser uh, quality signals. 
Okay. But if you have 400 megabits per second and you only need 25 megabits per second to stream a 4K stream, why do you need 400? Why wouldn't you get the 100 megabit per second cable modem plan? What content? Like games. The game files are huge. Like it's like 30 games in a day. Minimum 30 games now. Well, yeah, but that's a one time install. Yeah, so like if I want to buy eight games a week. Oh, no, I, mean, I get it. But you I mean to play the game. I'm saying at no point do I want to be limited. At no point do I want to have to be waiting for something to download. This is too much to ask. Fair enough. So the point is, is that some users are going to benefit from that larger bandwidth, right? But now when you, uh, let's say you're installing a 30 gigabyte game, do you usually start it installing and then do you just sit there and wait for it to finish? No. Or typically you starting that download before you go to bed or before you go out for a while or something like that? But I don't want to do that. I want it now. Like, yeah, but even with the fastest connection, you won't have it now. Like 30 seconds. 30 megabits. Uh, if you, if you have, if, if, it's a 30, if it's a 30, gig, 30 gigabyte, this is gigabyte, not bit. So 30 gigabyte file. You're not going to have that now. With with the That's Google's uh, one hour. with Google's fiber, you don't think I want to. Okay, what's the speed of Google's fiber? Gigabit. Yeah. Okay, one gigabit. Yes, yes, yes. Bit, yes. So bit, how long bit, does that bit. take? Can you do that math for me? Oh, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to still be like it's going to be absolutely under thirty minutes. Well, so why don't we take? Uh, so you're going to say thirty times eight, so it's two hundred and forty gigabits. So two hundred and forty seconds. For at maximum speed. Yeah. Okay, at maximum speed. Now, this assumes yes, that, Steve is gonna be able to that you're going to be able to grab it from them at a gigabit per second, yes. which you're not. I know. Yeah, Go you're ahead. not. Uh, what's the fastest download speed you've seen from Steam? Like 40. Wow, really? I think maybe. 40 maybe. megabytes? I can't. They do megabytes. They do yeah. Steam. Yeah. Yeah. Megabytes. Yeah. So, it was really fast. so you've seen like 40 megabytes. So Steam is, is pushing it out. Eh, that's, that's pretty legit. 40 megabytes is a... You're not going to find that kind of, I mean, that's, that's a high end. I'm pretty sure that's situation. Well, fine. No, fair enough. I'm just saying what's theoretically possible in our world today is <laughs> kind of what we're getting at. So 40 megabytes. So if you have a 30 gigabyte file that you're able to grab at 40 megabytes per second, so 30 gigabyte times 1,024 is 30,720 divided by 40, so that's 768 seconds. So divided by 60, it's 12 and a, uh, well, 13 minutes. You know, if the moon's aligned, you can get that 30 gigabyte file in 13 minutes. So in that scenario, that scenario, you're good to go. You know how long it takes me to download a 30, probably the whole day, yeah. at least. Well, like, I think that's not going to just take like 15, 16 hours, because like some games are literally like... GTA 5, it was like, oh, it launched, so next week I get to play it. Yeah. So next, so next It was like 60 gigs. That's living on campus or off campus? Off campus, what, and what's the internet connection speed? I pay for 60. Okay, you're paying for 60 megabits. Yeah. Okay, so that means that 60 megabits divided by 8, so you get 7.5 megabytes. And what was the size file that you had? We'll say 30. 30, okay, so. Um, well, 60 if you want to do GTA 5. Okay, that was the one that took you a week? Yeah. So 60 times 1,024 divided by 7.5 is 8,192 seconds divided no, by 60 is... Seconds? seconds? Yeah, it's per second. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, well, now this is assuming that Steam was delivering it to me. At full speed. speed. At they full were speed. delivering it to me at about 2 megabytes. No, I get it. I get it. Yeah, this is theoretical uh, maximum speed. Yeah. So this is, where, we're, 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 this is where the rubber meets the road for us. So that's seconds uh, divided by 60. So 2.27 minutes. No, no. I didn't. <laughs> 60 minutes, 60. Six, that time was less than what you said it would be for the 30 this gigabytes. Is, this is 60 gigabytes times 1,024 that gets us megabytes divided by 7.5, sorry, 7.5, which gives us the number of seconds it will take to download that many megabytes. Mm -hmm. so, so divided by 60, that's the number of minutes. Yep. Oh, okay. I, I got you. I got you. I divided now by... Can you do it one more time? Well, yeah, do it one more yeah, I got you. I got you. Then that's hours. So, two, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I did say that. So, two, two point two eight hours is the theoretical maximum. Okay, but now you're saying in real life whether you're. And if I'm doing that, then that means that I don't get to use my internet at all anymore. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. 
So this is a theoretical maximum in real life, but realistically this doesn't happen, right? Even with the, the, those of us who have fast internet connections that we're not saying is running too slow. You know, let's say on, on my internet, if it's a 60 gigabyte uh, file like that, it's probably at least an hour to, to download the thing, right? I mean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this would be theoretical maximum. It's probably at least four hours to download that thing on my, my internet, all right? So not the theoretical maximum. So what am I doing with that extra bandwidth? Well, you said if you happen to be able to max your bandwidth, now you're going to be, uh, um, you know, not being able to do anything else. You can't check your email, can't do anything else. You have, can't stream Netflix while you're waiting for your game to download. So today, the reason why we have these bigger, um, you know, wideband connections with lots of, uh, uh, lots of capability, it's less about downloading from a single source but more about having the ability to download at the best speed that we possibly can from a whole bunch of sources. Two different people watching Netflix, somebody playing video games, you're downloading some files, uh, somebody is doing a, uh, uh, a video chat, whatever it is. So now you have multiple people in, you know, in, a certain, in a single household using the internet for a bunch of different purposes without conflicting with each other, right? That's why we want more bandwidth today because very few places are going to be able to give us, I mean, so, you know, this whole 40 megabytes per second thing is a moon's aligned for 19 minutes one day when nobody else was on campus and the network was working great, right? That's a one in, you know, once in a blue moon type thing. Your average uh, download speed on, uh, on Steam might be what? You said two megabytes, three megabytes, four megabytes, something like that, right? Which isn't crap. I mean, that's a decent... You can sustain four megabytes per second. You're, you're not like complaining, right? And you feel like if, as long as you can sustain that. If you're getting four megabytes per second constantly and it's not dropping down to two bits per second <laughs> or two bits per week. It's not even that. It's just if I ever notice anything. Like if I notice a stutter or a dip in service, then I'm like, wow, my you, internet's terrible. You freak out. Yes. Okay. People die. People, yeah, which, which is ironic. So that's almost like human nature, right? I mean, don't we see that? And we, you know, so we kind of twist this back to you know computing hardware. You know, what is fast today will be slow a month from now. You know, we I, last time we were talking about um, 56k modems. I mean, people used to wait in line to buy a 56 kilobyte, kilobit per second U.S. robotics modem because there was a really short supply of these things. Now, if you were to download your 30 gigabyte file <laughs> over that modem, first of all, you need to hopefully that you hope that you can maintain that dial-up connection for the seven or eight month period <laughs> while this download is progressing <laughs> and hope that it can recover. Because actually for a long time, we didn't have, uh, uh, there were actually programs that had come out that allowed you to pause and restart downloads between you know, dial-up sessions. Because if you didn't finish during your dial-up session uh, before somebody picked up the phone and disconnected, you had to start over. So, you know, it, it, and it used to be like a two megabyte file, which we don't even think about today, right? Two megabytes is nothing. I mean, you had to like make sure you cleared, cleared an afternoon. And because even though you were dialed up at, at maximum speed of 56 kilobits per second, you were only probably getting that uh, file at, you know, 2.4K a second because, you know, their download speed, their upload speed is your download speed. So you was, you know, pretty limited. So every single time something new comes out, we complain about what we used to brag about, don't we? I think downtown Milwaukee, uh, um, first quarter next year, is supposed to AT and T is supposed to bring in fiber, and we're supposed to get gigabit um, uh, broadband there. So it's their it's their equivalent to Google's uh, Google's high speed stuff. Um, so we're going to still have that same problem where you know most providers are not pushing a gigabit per second content out, but now you're going to be able to do mat you'll be ahead of the game for a period of time, right? Your your internet will not be the bottleneck for a period of time until everything is in 4K and then everything's in 8K and then all of a sudden you know you know right now we're saying well you have some giant file that's uh, you know, 100 gigabytes, well, in six years, a giant file will be 17 terabytes. It's like, 
like, oh, that's only a two terabyte download? <laughs> yeah, I just do that over my cellular. It's <laughs> I usually just have a download on my way home from work. <laughs> um, you know, so it, it's, a, uh, it's very interesting from a human nature perspective how we're never happy, right? Nothing ever pleases us. The second we're bragging about something, we're complaining about it, uh, you know, a, a, a day later. All right, so now something I was talking about before class today for a few minutes is uh, in the very, so I asked the question a few minutes ago about which you would prefer to have, cable or DSL, okay? Uh, does anybody want to make an argument for DSL? I like the consistency of it. Okay. Compared to, I don't want to come out there clipper wires. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have cable in Wyoming they, the infrastructure there wasn't great, so sharing was an issue there. Sure that you noticed it right away. Still I'm still trying to keep a straight face from the Wyoming thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, like you, yeah so I used to have internet in Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically like the Pony Express from Alex that they used elk. Yeah. It's, just, it's just the same thing. But, yeah, I don't know, the DSL, I, the, I never have any drop in service or anything. So. Okay, so it happened to be that, that where you were getting the service, um, they were you were feeling the problem from a cable, from the cable connection where DSL wasn't. Um, I'm yeah. sure it's probably different here. But. Well, no, it could be. Yeah, I mean, so at some point there, it's, you know, it, it comes down to the provider. You know, for instance, if you say you prefer McDonald's over Burger King, well, not all McDonald's are created equal, right? You know, you've been to some good McDonald's where the fries are always fresh, and then there you've been to those bad McDonald's where you're pretty sure these fries weren't made today, okay? Or the frozen McDonald's where you're pretty sure the fries weren't made. <laughs> have you ever had those? Where you actually have, like, like three or four fries that are still frozen, yeah, I mean, it's weird. I had that happen with a, a grilled chicken sandwich one time, too. Like, they just forgot to try. <laughs> my, wife's pose, my wife likes the filet of fish. Uh, so, um, she, and this has happened multiple times uh, at McDonald's in Grafton. Um, now, how hard is it to assemble a sandwich? The one in Grafton? Yeah, not the new one, the, the previous one. I mean, so so when you assemble a sandwich, I mean, there's not a whole lot of components to a sandwich, right? Fish is like yeah, one yeah, you got you got bottom bread, then you have fish, fish. then you have cheese. Half a piece of cheese, yeah, and then you have the you, know, you work at McDonald's because you know this, right? I just know oh. about McDonald's. All right, then then you have the tartar sauce and you have the bun. Okay, on more than three occasions that I can recall. The cheese has been on the outside of the top bun. <laughs> they wrapped it like that. Okay, and this wasn't like a one-time, you know, zig because they went zig when they should have zagged. This was more than three times. This has happened. I mean, I mean is that place is going to like? Are they going to have like multiple centers on Big Macs? No lettuce on Big Macs. The Big Mac sauce is going to be at the bottom of your thing of fries. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's, okay, so punchline is not all McDonald's are created equally, right? <laughs> I mean, you got those McDonald's where they kind of always get things right. Like, hey, I like that McDonald's because everything's pretty fresh. I mean, it's still McDonald's, but it, it's good for McDonald's. And then you have, this isn't even good for McDonald's. <laughs> this is, okay, I wouldn't feed this to, like, my, my dog. <laughs> Something like that. I once saw a YouTube video, I think, of... Uh, um, it was a dog taste test. I think it was McDonald's versus Burger King. And I'm not sure which the dog picked, but consistently the dog would just scarf down one of them and wouldn't even touch the other one. I mean, the, the, the owner would like switch wrappers and stuff, you know, like really try to fake the dog out. The dog always went to the burger it liked the best. You don't remember which one was? I don't remember. Right? I want to say it was Burger King. Yeah. I want to say the dog liked Burger King better, but I'm not positive. But, I mean, you don't really consider dogs typically to be all that concern, uh, discerning, right? You know, if it, if it might be edible. I feed them brown pellets, so, I mean, I don't think they have to yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. If, if it might be edible, they'll eat it, <laughs> right? I mean, there's that. I'm uh, the, about the other burger, though. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like, there's that Frisky's commercial, the deer kitten ones, where they, you know, the, the older cat's introducing the kitten to the, the dog. 
and said, let me, let me tell you about the type of intelligence we're dealing with. This is the type of animal that determines whether to put something in its mouth by putting it in its mouth. <laughs> and then just determining whether it should keep it in there. But generally speaking, if a dog's not going to eat it, you shouldn't be eating it. <laughs> you do have picky dogs. Anybody in here have a picky eater, eater dog? But in general, it doesn't even have to be close to food. At a time. <laughs> Especially retrievers, right? Our golden retrievers kind of just known to, if it might be chewable. And even... E <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, and I think it was like a run. Yeah, like the owner tried to get it to like all these obstacles, and the first two dogs just zip right through, and you had this gold retriever get up, and he stopped at every single ball. <laughs> that, that dog knew what he was doing. <laughs> it's like, look, I'm not going to win this race, but I won this race. <laughs> these other dudes, they're going to be begging for food in a few minutes. <laughs> I still brought some with me. All right, so, um, you know, most of us today would pick cable, all things being equal. Just because, I mean, if we, if we forget about the underlying technology, if we forget about all that and just say maximum speed, cable has a higher maximum speed. All right, now you start flipping that over and you look at some of the new fiber technologies. Google, AT&T, uh, Verizon has a technology called Fios. Um, you know, the infrastructure isn't built out for these too much yet, right? Um, but once we have it, you know, once that becomes the next step where gigabit is the norm and all of a sudden places will be offering 10 gigabit per second connections and um, then if you're only getting 3 gigabits, Dover is going to be complaining. Like, look, I'm paying for 10, I'm getting 3 gigabits per second, okay? I have my 2 terabyte file, it's taking me 4 minutes to download it and I just don't have that kind of time. What are you guys? What are you guys babbling about? What we got? What we got? What we got here? Stupid oh, you're doing your 490 stupid. homework? I just, it's just stupid. Huh? It doesn't work. Huh? It doesn't work. Like, oh, you cheated off them? No, the book is wrong. Oh, is it? Is this the omnibus book? Yeah, he gives us a book with errors in it. What's that about? <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure the newest version is edited by Trump. Well, I mean, as you know, sometimes <laughs> teachers ask questions that they didn't quite think all the way through. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, and that well, it doesn't end there. I mean, for me, it's usually I would say at least once a semester per class, sometimes twice. Yeah. That I ask a question that I didn't really think through very well, and then it ends up being way harder, or sometimes way easier, but it's usually the way, it's usually the way harder side of it. Um, so then, what does the teacher do? You know, we get enjoyment out of your suffering, and then we just curve it back in, and uh, you know. Yeah, you've never handled it unfairly. Well, I mean qualms except for the, <laughs> the the new profane words you were inventing when you were doing my homework. <laughs> like I don't think that's a word. <laughs> I looked it up in the Irish dictionary. It is. <laughs> All right. So uh, early days of cable versus DSL, kind of before these technologies uh, matured, let's say there was a weakness with cable. Okay, what was what was this weakness? If you, if you had gotten a cable modem day one because you liked the download speed, what was the problem with those day one cable modems? Um, well, that's, I'll, I'll follow it up with a why. Why would your connection uh, potentially drop? Would it interfere with your Well, uh, so in, in this, this might, uh, this would have played out pretty easily, I think, maybe 10 years ago. Um, but uh, if you've had, uh, same thing with uh, uh, DirecTV or Dish Network, uh, those had the, the same limitation. Have you ever had a television service to your house where you had to plug a phone line into the back of it for like to, in order to have the on-demand uh, um, stuff? Yeah. You know, so... 
uh, whether you know it's it's the pay per view movies or uh, you know so before we had on demand you had the you know like it wasn't that was on not on cable but usually if you have the pay per view movies right yeah. you've got to pay for it yeah. well the problem was this was true of cable as well as the satellite technologies it was download only the signal was broadcast to your house there was no request. Okay, so you had to, it had a dial-up modem inside of the cable box for it to uh, dial out to purchase the movie, which would then unlock it in your account, allowing your system to download it. Okay, but the box itself could not request the movie. That makes sense. You can now. This is not a problem anymore. But for a long time, if you wanted to have cable modem service at your house, you had to have the cable modem service. Plus, you had to have a dial-up for the requests. You would type in www.google.com, press enter. That request would go out over the dial-up connection. And then the response would download over the cable modem connection. That makes sense? Now, the same thing's true today in terms of, I mean, our upload, our home internet connections, when we say we have 60 megabits per second, what's your actual upload speed over? Six, okay, it's probably, my guess is it's probably 60 by five. It's probably what you're paying for. Seven. Uh, it could be. Yeah, it seems like they usually do it in fives for the upload, but whatever. Yeah, so let's, let's just say it's 60 by six. So you're paying for 60 megabit down by six megabit up. Okay, so that's a uh, asynchronous internet connection. Now, why is the upload speed so much slower than your download speed? Okay, well, I mean, every internet user uploads. But it's, you're going to download a lot more than you're going to upload. The size of your downloads are bigger, right? When I type in www.google.com, that's a tiny little whisper message that's going out. That's my upload, right? And what am I getting back? Well, Google's a pretty simple page, so I'm getting some HTML and a graphic. <laughs> but let's go to Microsoft's uh, main portal where you... Uh, you just have widgets all over the place, right? So you're downloading a much bigger file than the msn.com request that you're sending out. Similarly, when do we use our uh, upload speeds the most uh, under uh, traditional situations? Probably adding attachments to emails, that kind of stuff. You know, now we're using those upload uh, speeds for like BitTorrent when we're participating in uh, um, uh, sharing a file. Now, now, BitTorrent in and of itself is not an illegal technology. That technology happens to be leveraged for a lot of questionable things. But plenty of games and stuff like that today do their updates using BitTorrent now. For the very reason that we talked about earlier today, where a lot of, we don't have a single source that can deliver maximum bandwidth to us. Windows 10 even started doing it. Well, um, they should. Well, they shouldn't. It was, just, it was shady. The way they did it, well, they didn't tell anybody. Well, okay. But, but in, from, a, from a consumer uh, performance perspective, they really should. They should tell people. They should tell people. But, you know, if you have a million people, and it's more than that, obviously, but you have a million people all trying to download the latest update from Microsoft servers, I don't care how much money or how much bandwidth they have, they're going to run out. That's why they should stagger the updates. But even that's not going to help. All I'm saying is it's not. it shouldn't be my job to deliver your updates. If you want to take over my bandwidth and stuff like that, I should be able to charge you for it. You should be able to, you should give me some Windows credit, store credit or something. There should be some way, that, you know, am I crazy for thinking that? Maybe. Yeah, so you so, can do that. But, but don't you have some video games that updates run in BitTorrent that you probably don't complain about? I don't think, I don't, Steam doesn't do that. I'm almost 100% positive they have their own servers, so yeah, I don't know what else. I would, would really, I would, it would probably, it would honestly surprise me. I don't know for Steam. But many, many games do their updates that way now. Because, I mean, you've already mentioned today that your goal is to get stuff as quickly as possible. Yeah, I'm not mad about peer-to-peer -peer if I'm told about it. I, and I agree with that. Yeah, Microsoft should not hijack your internet connection and use, use it without your permission. Yeah, I mean, there should be a pop-up that says, hey, this is what we're doing now. It's to benefit your... Um, and you could even be a, a, a limit thing, you know, where this is, well, you know... The maximum upload speed we'll use from you is this, so we're barely using your internet or something, but you're just part of the big community of, of, of downloads. Um, you know, but the, the punchline is, is that regardless of the ethics of this, 
our upload speed is somebody else's download speed. Okay, and the reason why our internet, internet providers today don't want us to use, uh, don't well, they don't want us to run servers. So A, it's asynchronous because they don't have to give us as much bandwidth. But B, they also don't want us to run servers out of our house. So if we're only up uh, able to do six megabits per second upload, that means that you know that's the maximum amount somebody else can download from us at any point in time, six megabits per second. Um, now, having said that, you also then have some other security things where you know you could be sitting behind a firewall, have a fake IP address, things like that, where it becomes even more difficult for other reasons why you can't, uh, and that's more networking topics, but why you might not be able to run a server from your house. But in the early days of cable modems, we had a limitation where uh, it was more expensive and inconvenient to get that extra speed. Um, so a lot of people went with uh, DSL, but then with DSL, what was the biggest problem with DSL in the early days? Mm, tell me about that. You could use the phone and DSL yeah, at the same time. Because uh, DSL didn't use the analog signal in the phone. It used the copper as a conductor. Well, didn't it just communicate over different channels? Yeah, it split it. Yeah. The, the, the filter split the thing where you had your normal analog line, and then it, it pulled off the digital signal. Yeah, it split it, I think, zero to... But how did it to make it perform? I mean, there's, there's one copper wire running to your thing. Correct. So how do you transmit two different things? Uh, because they weren't transmitting the same way. Yeah, so what it was was voice was just over zero to run electricity through. Is there another yeah, but, yeah, but analog didn't. I mean, analog is, is a, a wave technology. Is there a telephone? It, it, uh, uh, it's a pulse wave across the thing. So it is electricity, but it's electricity on a, on a completely different bandwidth. Where digital is uh, a series of zeros and ones pulsing on the line. I mean, so they, they're easily separable. Uh, well, easily is in the eye of the older, I guess. But so are you able to send both of those at the same exact yes. time? I can send a... Yeah. You just happen to be sharing the same wire. All right. Um, all right. Anything else of interest between uh, DSL and cable that we came up with? So let's talk about memory. Did we start talking about this? So we were talking about data representation. We talked about JSON and XML. Um, all right, so let's talk about the nature of memory. Um, so we've, on several different occasions in here, talked about a bunch of different types of memory. We've talked about registers and system RAM, and we talked about cache a little bit and, and, and that kind of stuff. But if you had to just take it all the way down to the generic level, what is memory? What's the purpose of it? Give me as much as you can give me. Go ahead. Okay. Um, what's the purpose of memory? Why do we need it? Okay, and why do we need to hold things? So, take this back to real life. We all use our memory pretty, pretty often. Whether we believe we have a good memory or a bad memory, we, we rely on our memory. You know, we all remember our name and phone number and different things. We remember what we had for breakfast. Now, some of those things get lost in the, in the mix. I always think it's funny when my wife will... You know, just to swear by something like, oh, yeah, it was this. But then I'll ask her, well, what did you have for lunch yesterday? <laughs> no clue. And then the bad part is she's usually right about whatever we're arguing about. <laughs> I should just start off assuming she's right, but I basically think I'm infallible. So it's. I guess I eventually, when we've been married, it'll be, uh, it'll be 17 years in May. Eventually, she just thinks it's cute. It's like, well, he's wrong most of the time, but it's kind of fun just to mess with him. I really get that impression. I'm like kind of a pet at this point. <laughs> All right, so 
uh, we, we need to remember things. What kind of things are we remembering in a computer? So in our, in our mind, we're remembering factoids and somehow magically our brain makes it work. But in a computer, what are we doing? Okay. Zeros and ones. Okay. And let's take it down to the, 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 the minimal level. We're remembering a single zero and or, or one. If I want to remember a, a byte, I need to remember eight sequence, uh, a sequence of eight zeros and ones. But let's take it down to the, the bare minimum level. I need to remember a single zero or one. So now we're going to put ourselves back in time to you know the, the, the birth of the computer, let's say. Um, and we need to come up with some way, based on the, uh, the widgets we have laying around, to store a single zero or a one. All right, we already started off with this idea of data representation, where we're going we're gonna to represent uh, our, our uh, information in our computer through series, a series of zeros and ones. But now we need to break it down and say, I need to be able to hold one zero or one. So the very first question, if I say you need to be able to store a zero or one, you might say, well, how long do I need to hold it for? Right? Do I need to hold it when I own power? That's another good question. That's another good question. All right, so you know, we, we, we start off with, so for instance, if I asked each of you to remember the number five, okay, and a year from now, I ask you to tell me what, kind, what number I told you to remember. Some of you might remember because it's kind of a weird, stupid trivia thing, right? But in general, when I say remember the number five, you've kind of thrown that into the compartment of, I'm going to remember this for like three minutes, right? Okay, you know, it's a short-term story. You just didn't want me to forget. I remember the number five, remember the number five. You know, you repeat it inside your head over and over and over again. Um, and then once it's gone, it's gone. But if I ask you about that number a year from now, there'll be, you know, one or two, like, you know, freaky memory people to say, oh, it was a five. And this was the date, this was the time, and this was the color shirt you were wearing. Um, <laughs> you know, and, you know, this is, you know, then they start describing stuff inside my house, and it just gets really creepy. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but then if I tell you something, you know, let's say you need a locker combination. Okay, so if somebody tells you the locker combination, or the, the cars now have the, the, the combination on the, the door, right? Um, you know, those are things that you put into longer term memory, right? You try to commit that to memory. But, you know, but today we, we leverage technology, right? How many of you uh, uh, don't really remember those things? Maybe if you use it all the time, you eventually start remembering it. Or it becomes, any of you have like the, the mechanical locker combinations that you don't know the numbers, but you can open the lock? That's possible. Yeah, like, yeah, the pattern. Like, it just doesn't line up to the right numbers. Right? But you don't you you could not say what the numbers were, but you could still do it. Yeah, when you just do it so many times, that is. That's how my uh, this is my card demo. It's like I don't know the numbers. I just know the pattern. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't tell somebody what the numbers are. You could figure it out if you just watched yourself do the pattern. Um, yeah, it's it's humans are weird. Yeah, but you know, so we we kind of have internally different storage mechanisms. We don't know where we're putting the stuff. We just kind of know this is a short-term storage, this is a longer-term storage, and you know, then we start putting stuff in, you know, uh, you know when we want to store passwords on our, uh, uh, you know, on our phone or something like that, we start encrypting our passwords. You know, we have those three or four passwords you use pretty commonly, and you just give yourself enough of that password to know which of the passwords it is. You know, you don't really write the whole password down because that's insecure. You know, <laughs> instead you give yourself like two digits from it or something like that, and that kind of flags you in as to which of your normal passwords it is. Um, but we, you know, we use tools for remembering things. Um, well, when we're talking about a computer and we need to represent a single zero or one for some period of time, whether it's short term or whether it's long term, we need to come up with different ways of doing this. And in order to do that, we need to kind of come up with some uh, theories as to how we can remember something, okay, how we can remember a single zero or a one. So now, based on what we know right now, how might you represent a zero or a one at all? Forget about whether it's persistent or how long it lasts, blah, blah, blah. Just based on the widgets we have available to us, how could we represent a single zero or a one? 
talked about this guy recently. I think what we talked about was the if it's below 50% power, then it's a zero. If it's above 50% power, then it's a one. Okay, and, and who was the dude that did that? Transistor. Okay, so the, a transistor allows us to represent a single zero or a one, right? Now, if we want a transistor to represent that single zero or one for a prolonged period of time, prolonged meaning something more than just a, a, a millisecond or something like that, how would we handle that? So we'll introduce electricity here for a second. Okay, so we have electricity flowing uh, through this transistor, and at a certain point, you know, we talked about uh, when we when we talked about the transistor. Uh, I think um, you know I was I tried to demystify it a little bit, where you you have the 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 two inputs and then a, uh, a controller, and based on a small amount of electricity going to one of the uh, uh, the inputs, the thing arcs either positive or negative, either a zero or a one. So it's a relatively small amount of electricity that is able to allow something to fire either, well, fire a one or not fire a zero. So we can read from that guy. All right. Now, when we read a value from our transistor, that gives us whether it holds. So let's say our transistor is currently firing a one. And we read from that. You know, we're, we're collecting that information over here, let's say. We have the one now. We know that the value it stored is a one, but the transistor no longer stores it. Now, usually when we read something from memory, don't we also want it to remain in memory? Typically, right? So for instance, if I ask you what your phone number is and you spit your phone number out to me, that's not it, right? You're, that's not the last time you're gonna be able to tell me your phone number, okay? You're not just taking it out of storage and say, Bon voyage, <laughs> right? No, no, no more phone number. You know, it's still in there, right? And we don't necessarily know how that works. This is all magical uh, stuff. But you know, punchline is is that when we read a value from something, you know, whether it's a transistor or some other magical piece of electronic equipment, if that thing no longer represents that value, we have that value. So we've read it. We have to write it back, All right? So. It's a two-step process, at least, to get a value and write the value back so that value is available for somebody else to read. All right, so if we think about this in terms of real life, okay, I'm gonna, I, I, we have a little shoebox sitting up here. And inside the shoebox is a, um, you know, let's, let's say it's a checker. It's either gonna be a red checker or a black checker. Okay, that's a zero or a one. Now, when I come up here and I check the shoebox, I look in the shoebox, I pick up the checker, so I read from the shoebox. Now the checker is not in the shoebox. I now have the value, I can do something based on the value, but I have to write that checker back to the shoebox so that when Dover comes and checks the shoebox, he finds a checker in there. Now, what happens if I uh, have just read from the shoebox and he goes to read from the shoebox before I've written back to the shoebox? It's not there, right? You don't, you don't get the phone number. You don't get the checker color. Because I've read the checker. I've read it from the shoebox. You have to take it from the shoebox. To read it. We're assuming however we're representing the memory. So I'm kind of creating an abstraction here. However we're representing the memory, in order to read from it, breaks the storage of that value. All right? So when I take that checker out of the box, and I'm, I've read it, nobody else can read. Well, if you want to read from that, you're, you're, you're going to be disappointed, right? There's no value there for you to read from. So now it's on me to, after I have the value and I make my decision, that I write back to that guy. Now that takes time. So what we should start thinking about here is that checking a memory location isn't as easy as just glancing at it and moving on with life. It's a read followed by a write. In fact, for some of our memory technologies, which we'll, we'll talk about in more detail after break, but... Um, it's a read followed by several writes, or sometimes it's several reads followed by several writes. When we're dealing with memory, that kind of error checks itself. Go ahead. Where are you? Are you a process? Uh, I, I, I could be. I could be anything. But yeah, it could be a process where I'm a, you know, I'm a computer program that had to check the current value of some variable. 
uh, but I only just checked the first bit <laughs> of it in, in this example. Um, but just anything that's interested in uh, a value at a memory address. Um, so it could be uh, from our assembly language, it could be one, one of our add instructions or something like that where we're grabbing something from a variable, uh, that kind of thing. All right, so when we read from it, it also requires a write back or possibly several write backs depending on the nature of that memory. So we're kind of talking about this memory at a very high level right now, just thinking about the, the generalistic idea of storing stuff, retrieving it, and having to put it back. Okay, because retrieving data, at least in many cases, is destructive. That makes sense? All right. Um, so, now, if I'm going to read from this shoebox, and I have the checker, and I'm still in the process of processing the checker, and Dover comes to try to check that shoebox, he's not going to have his value. So now we have a conflict, right? Either I need to write back more quickly, or, well, and... We need to block him from reading from that memory location until I've written back. Does that make sense? Now, what we're seeing here is kind of the things that differentiate different speed memories. Okay, the, uh, the underlying nature of the type of memory it is. You know, we, we've talked about it in here that registers are faster than system RAM and so on and so forth. We've mentioned cache kind of in the middle there. So there's all sorts of different speed memories. So we might assume that the nature, how those memory, how those different memory types are created, likely has faster read and write accesses, right? So that when I read it and write it back, it takes less time, which then allows somebody else to write it back. But the trade-off for that faster time is typically expense, heat, capacity, that kind of stuff, right? You know, our, our entire system RAM is not made up of registers. Um, that would be kind of cool if somebody did that and just said, Money's no object, space is no object, go. <laughs> um, I mean, it'd be kind of impressive, I guess, but uh, you know, we, they, they, all we would do is move the bottleneck. Right? It would be some interesting research where if you tried to take something that's known to be a current bottleneck and just said, this is no longer a bottleneck, <laughs> find out where we bump next. You, know? you think we don't know that? Um, well, I mean, I think if we, if we thought about a specific problem, we could probably figure it out. But when we're starting, I mean, where our current limitations are is when we're looking at problems, you know, at the, uh, you know, fraction of a nanosecond level. Um, and then uh, dealing with things that are almost immeasurable. You know, the, the movement in the middle of a game between one math, uh, you know, one ad versus another ad. You know, it's happening so quickly that we can't see it. it you know, I, I always kind of compare it to uh, uh, like, the thing, like a Large Hadron Collider where they're, you know, um, investigating uh, subatomic particles where they have, you know, they have a whole bunch of cameras, like super high speed cameras there. And they zip these subatomic particles around and they collide them into each other and just take a bunch of pictures and see what they see. I mean, that's, that's what they do. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very like uh, almost caveman type thing. Like we're just going to smash these things together and look at it. <laughs> okay, we got to look at it really, I mean, that's really what it is. It seems like all, you know, science fiction even, that's what they're doing, is they're smashing things together as hard as they possibly can, and then watching what they turn into when they break. Okay, but they have to take those pictures so quickly in order to be able to see it. And it's hard to measure those, because sometimes these things happen so quickly, or they're so tiny that we can't see them. Right? So the same thing happens when we're measuring things from two different sources and we see something read from one memory location to another memory location or we're doing this math problem followed by this math problem and the amount of human recognizable time in the middle is, is basically nothing. Those are very difficult things for us to, to, to observe. All right? So that's kind of where it might be difficult to find that bottleneck. Um, you know, where is the, where's the actual slowdown? But you know, those can all turn into interesting research papers and you know, it works out, but, you know, uh, uh, so, you know, our idea here with, uh, with memory is we have different ways we can represent things, but we have trade-offs. If we want memory to be really, really, really fast, so let's take registers, for example. How many people are competing for our registers at one time?
well, the CPU houses the register. So, so who's using the CPU? Processor. The guy's doing the instructions. Okay. And how, how many processes on a single CPU, single core CPU, how many processes are currently getting CPU time on a single core? One. One dude. Okay. Now, you know, he's getting some CPU time and he gets kicked off and somebody else gets some CPU time. Okay. But we have one dude getting CPU time on a single core, and each core has its own collection of registers, right? So if you have a quad core, you're going to have four AXs, four BXs. Oh. So then do, are we ever going to have the problem of the checker box? How would you have that problem? They all have their own registers, so... Uh, well, so that's if we're dealing with registers. If we deal with system oh, RAM, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, registers, I mean, you're right. That's, I'm about to you know, you kind of step, you're, you're in front of where I'm going. So the idea is that with a register, we only have one, oh, this, this, this person's competing with themselves, right? So it's not like we have two different sources who are trying to read that checker. It's I go and grab the checker, and the next person who might try to access that checker is, is me. So, and since a read instruction, as we've kind of loosely pointed out, is a read followed by a write, right? I get the value and I wrote it back magically, right? You know, because our, our instruction set says, you know, move this value into, uh, into this value or, um, you know, so we actually, to move, uh, um, move AX comma BX requires a read from BX, right? <laughs> read, write, haha. <laughs> Okay, so move AX comma BX requires us to read from BX and write to AX. But what I'm saying under the hood, it also requires a write to BX. So we had to write that value back. We had to read it from BX, we're moving it from BX. We then wrote it to AX and we wrote it back to BX. So that BX is back to its original state because we broke it to do the read. Does that make sense? But now for us, we know that these assembly instructions are happening linearly on a per CPU basis, right? So the next person who's going to read from AX is us. So we don't have to worry about that competition when it comes to our registers like that. All right, so with that in mind, we can make that guy a lot faster because we don't have to throw all this error checking crap in there, right? We don't have to lock that register down to make sure somebody else doesn't access it because every, the nature of this guy is linear. Make sense? That's why registers, well, that's one of the reasons why registers are very fast. Because there's less we're having to do to, to, to protect them. Now let's go to the other extreme. Well, it's not the full extreme, but let's go halfway down the road and go to system RAM. Okay, so now we're back to what you were saying, Ann, about, uh, Andy, about the uh, um, multiple processes running on the computer. And these guys might all be competing for the same RAM, right? So you might have Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel try to read from the same place in memory, you know, maybe checking your, uh, uh, you know, validating your, your, your software key or something like that to make sure you're running legal software or something like that. Okay. And when this guy reads from it, um, that read operation can be destructive. So that read and write that's happening here in order to do the single read takes more time because we have more things to lock down up here to prevent this guy from getting in there and doing a read until this guy, this, this data has been recovered, or, you know, put back to where it was. Does that make sense? So that's one of the reasons why it is slower, because the amount of overhead we have. Now, what are other reasons why it might be slower? What might be slower? System RAM versus a register. Um, yeah, uh, well, I can. It depends on the type of RAM. That's not registers so much as it is in the, as when, oh, we, when we talk about the different types of RAM. So we have like DRAM and SRAM. Um, some of them do these things called word lines. So it's like a, um, the more error detection and correction, uh, typically the slower the RAM is. Okay. Now, an uh, observation we might make in real life is that the larger the RAM is, the larger the memory is, the slower the memory is, right? So our, uh, what's the slowest memory we know about? In, the, in a computer, what's the slowest way to remember things? Hard drive, okay, the old spinny ones, right? 
I'm, yeah, mechan mechanical, mechanical. It's the, it's the British. I don't even think British people say it that way. Mechanical. I have a British friend. I should ask him. Because um, he says a whole bunch of weird things. Huh? Rob? Oh, no, I know Rob, too. No, I have another British friend that I, uh, Pat Pomeroy, uh, Angela's husband. You know Angela, right? The, she was the, the huh? Angela Pomeroy, the, the woman that was helping out in the department here last, last oh, semester. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah, her husband is a, a, a British dude. He says a whole bunch of weird stuff. Do you know the Brits use the word boot for like a whole bunch of stuff? Yeah, the boot of the car is the trunk. Then it's also like a normal boot. Um, but not all boots are boots. What? Yeah, it's, I, I, I don't have all the examples on the top of my head right now, but there's literally maybe like eight or nine uses of the word boot. In, 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 in what, the high, is that high English? <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the Queen's English, I think is what they call it, the Queen's English. Um, but typically, the larger our memory, uh, the slower it is. So we take we think about our mechanical hard drives. You know, even today, our, our you know, I mean, I still sell mechanical hard drives, right? So what's the what's the biggest size mechanical hard drive we might bump into today? Four terabytes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 ordering off a new egg or something like that, you know, and and not you know not looking at some sort of proprietary solution where they've you know, Frankenstein's monster, uh, <laughs> some hard drive platters together, four terabytes, okay? Now, what about solid states? So solid states are kind of our, that's our fast hard drives today, right? So we expect them to be slower than system RAM, but we expect them to be faster than these mechanical ones. What's the, what's the, what's a big size solid state drive today? One terabyte, one terabyte uh, two terabytes exist. Really? Uh, like you can, like you can like order the new MacBook Pro with two terabytes. Well, like, oh. In terms of theoretically possible. Crazy expensive. Because what they're doing, is, that kind of comes down to my Frankenstein's monster type thing. Where they've, they've taken a technology oh and they just God, said, right. let's link this guy to this guy to this guy to this guy. And, oh, that's 16 terabytes. <laughs> Correct. But at some point, form factor stops making sense, right? You know, that's why you don't have laptops that have a 16 terabyte solid state drive in there. Because you've given up the... a 60 terabyte SSD. Yeah, and how much is it? And how big is it? I mean, the thing, it's probably going to be $25,000 and the thing's going to be the size of like a truck tire. <laughs> you know, they installed onto your laptop with epoxy and, a <laughs> and uh, you know, some sort of gigantic cable. <laughs> for the, you know, they handle the bandwidth with the right to that thing. Okay, so, you know, in any case, um, when we deal with, so let's just keep our, you know, let's just keep us in the two terabyte world, okay? So we have our, uh, we have our four terabyte mechanical drives, and we drop down to two terabyte solid state drives, which are faster than our mechanical drives, but a lot slower than system RAM. It might not be that way forever, but, you know, do we suspect that as solid state drives get faster and faster and faster during that same period of time, do we think that our system RAM is going to get faster and faster as well? You know, and then there's, at some point, there's going to be a jump. And technology, and these are some of the things we're going to talk about next week, is, you know, we're, and we're already seeing this with hardware in general today, that we've started hitting some limitations on how can we make things faster. You know, we did it with processors, right? You know, so our processors today, in terms of clock speed, are pretty similar to our processors from four, five, six years ago. You know, but what has changed? Well, we're better, at, uh, they, they take less power today, we're better at dissipating heat so we can make things smaller. Um, uh, we've added more cores, so, you know, you know why have uh, one when we can have four <laughs> of, the, of the same speed, that kind of stuff. So that's where we're spreading out, but eventually, we've already kind of talked about that at, a, at least a high level, is more cores is not always better. It depends on the type of problem you're solving. And adding more cores to a processor doesn't necessarily make our computing experience any better. Um, so right now, in terms of a consumer machine, the, the most number of cores we have on, on typical laptops might be a quad core, right? I don't think I've seen a laptop with, uh, um, there might be a laptop with a six core or something like that for like a, a workstation laptop or something, but I don't think I've seen dual quad cores or anything like that. Um, you know, 
punchline is is that you get to a point where the types of problems we're solving as as you know even even professional technology users aren't going to be able to leverage more than like four cores. You know, we're not doing 16 things simultaneously that we're really going to benefit from this. Where we, where we see that, that benefit is in our current GPUs, where our GPUs might have 1,024 or 2048 cores because each one of those cores just does math. You know, it's just doing a whole bunch of math problems. That's that's what that guy does. Um, so, you know, we're... we're we're kind of poised at some point, whether it's, uh, you know, in three years or in 15 years, I, I don't know. Um, I'd like to think it's in the next decade. You know, we're kind of at a point where we're going to have to make a leap, right? Where we're going we're, we're to have to get out of our current model of what computing looks like and move to something else. Um, you know, we, we've seen some examples of like quantum computing. Um, you know, and you know, we, I think we mentioned that last class, but, you know, quantum computing is taking advantage of some, um, you know, some physics science-y stuff and saying, here's a new way of representing zeros and ones. You know, so we have a way of representing zeros and ones that, add, that doesn't give off any heat. Well, that seems cool. <laughs> That's like a Pastor Smith type joke, isn't it? Actually, I'm kind of ashamed at this point. <laughs> That's really bad. So you missed my joke entirely, didn't you? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't that good, though. Uh, it actually kind of was funny, and that's what's bad about it. I said, like, quantum computers, you know, they, they, it's our way of representing zeros and ones, but it doesn't give off any heat, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> ha. Ha. I wouldn't have laughed at that anyways. So yeah, and, and it wasn't even on purpose. That I was accidentally that corny. Oh, this is the beginning of the end. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so so in any case, we're kind of poised to make a jump because right now we're we're figuring out what's the most we can do inside of uh, our current technology. Uh, yesterday, I had a uh, uh, a lunch with a um, Jesuit priest. It's an interesting interesting lunch, and we were talking about uh, um, various technologies. And one of the things that came up, came up was European TV. The guys from Germany. And, you know, for years, European TV was way ahead of American TV. And why do you think that was? Hmm? Uh, it's actually the other way around. Oh, okay. So they had to upgrade their infrastructure. We had it first. So we already had an infrastructure in place, so all our upgrades had to play within this rule set. Europe was able, you know, to learn from our lessons two or three years down the line. And their infrastructure was put in. It was newer equipment, new, you know, based on some of the mistakes that we had that we had to live with. So it's kind of an interesting thing. We see that with technology. And, um, you know, Android is a good example. You know, for years, Google Android was significantly behind Apple uh, on the iPhone because they were about two years behind the, behind the ball. Well, now... You could, I mean, depending on you know, personal preference, you could make a good argument for Android being um, every bit as good as iOS. You know, it really just depends on who has the coolest feature that improves your life. You know, these are solid products. All right, so no homework. Uh, have a, a safe trip if you're going someplace. Uh, bring me back stuff. If, you, if it's stuff that I like, like Skyline Chili and... Oh, where? What's up? Yeah, I like beef jerky. Anything low carb. Um, yeah, I have to do low carb. Beef jerky, I can do beef jerky. Yeah, but not like mashed potatoes and and stuffing. I mean, I'll eat that that day, but like this is going to be a really bad cheating week for me. That's like classic Thanksgiving. I know.